Hello and welcome to another episode of the CG Garage. This is episode number 312. Uh, we're featuring Habib Zargapur, head of film development at Digital Monarch Media, which is a uh, subsidiary of Unity 3D. What pretty cool. Uh, Habib, <laughs> Habib is, uh, shall we say, a veteran of the industry. He has been around for a long time, mm -hmm. right, Kristen? Very, very long. Yeah, yeah. What were some of the cool things that uh, you remembered about this podcast? Uh, well, I, I liked how like the first Blade Runner is what inspired him, and then he got to work uh -huh. on the new Blade Runner, so that was awesome. Yes. Um, and we go on a deep, deep dive into Blade yes. Runner. So if you if you're a Blade Runner 2049 fan, as I am, and and uh, really love you know Roger Deakins stories, which would be even more incredible. So this is a really deep dive into that. It's awesome, awesome, awesome. Yeah. Anyway, go oh, ahead. Keep going. And <laughs> he, I mean, yeah, he's worked on like some heavy VFX projects. And like Perfect Storm and Star Wars Episode yeah, Twister. One. Yes. But Perfect Storm <laughs> yeah. was actually the name of our soccer team growing up because of that movie. So I remember. Yeah, really? I love that movie. There you go. Um, and Excellent. you guys talk about like at the very end, like about the pod racers going 800 miles an hour, but it's actually in the system it's going like that. That was interesting to me because I didn't, I didn't know. So. Yeah, yeah, there's an interesting problem uh, for it's actually an interesting ray tracing problem or or rendering problem because of uh, um, uh, a floating point uh, 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 precision errors that can happen when you're traveling at 800 miles an hour. It's really hard to actually get rendering to be accurate. We learned this actually on on Tron uh, for the jets and the uh, the bikes because they're traveling at such high speed that you actually have precision problems. But it's solvable. <laughs> we did it on on Tron, etc. It's a really good uh, a really good exercise to find out how to how to do that anyway really cool stuff really mm -hmm. great talking to habib he's a really like i said really knowledgeable person uh he has been doing this for a long time he's you know won you know many accolades baftas and uh, well not uh, nominated and won accolades and, and really a fantastic person uh, in, in that area and really cool, we get into a deep dive into virtual production. Obviously, he has a big interest in virtual production that's going on there. Uh, Digital Monarch Studio is obviously involved with Unity uh, in terms of understanding some of those things. So it was really great to have him on, uh, and it was great. It was This was uh, an introduction from Colin uh, Green, who... Um, who's been on the podcast before. So it was really nice to Colin to introduce us to Habib. So thank you so much, Colin, for doing this. It was a lot, a lot of fun having Habib on. Okay, we have a uh, an announcement. Um, the announcement we have is that basically uh, we are extending the Building Utopia competition by another month. Uh, we feel that we wanted to be able to give more people more opportunities. A lot of people that were, didn't necessarily have the opportunity to work on the competition during the holidays. So we figured we'll give an extension for a month because uh, that way the people have a little more time to get their work done or to see to enter the competition. So uh, if you guys are interested in, uh, in it, please uh, go ahead and join in. It's called is buildingutopia.cgarchitect.com is the link. Again, that's buildingutopia.cgarchitect.com. And for those of you who don't know, it is a competition that we have created with our partners at Lenovo, NVIDIA, Kitbash 3D, and CG Architect. And it is about using Vantage. Vantage is our uh, our real-time uh, ray tracer application. It's a standalone application which does fully real-time, fully ray traced. Uh, and you bring in your or your scene and you're able to do a lot of really cool stuff in Vantage, uh, which we figured was mailed to a competition. So we partnered with all those guys. And the Kitbash 3D guys created a really amazing asset that you were doing, and then we we're challenging you guys to create an animation inside of that asset. A lot of fun. Go check it out. Again, that's buildingutopia.cgarchitect.com. And if you want to check out Vantage, that is available as well, and it is free uh, as of now. It is free, uh, and it's available at chaosgroup.com to check out Vantage. All right, we have a couple of other uh, items in the news. Kristen, what else is going on? Yeah, so we have announced this already, but V-Ray 5 for Cinema 4D is out, and V-Ray 5 for Revit uh, Beta is out as well. That is correct. Mm -hmm. V-Ray 5 for Cinema 4D is very exciting. This is, uh, a lot of people have been using V-Ray for Cinema 4D, but this is V-Ray 5 for Cinema 4D, and this was entirely done by our team at Chaos Group uh, before we used to license out V-Ray to another third party, and they would develop V-Ray for C4D, but we decided to take over the development of that area. So we, this is completely new. Lots of new stuff in V-Ray for C4D. Would love to have your feedback. It's a really big package, a really big news for us, so let us know. V-Ray 5 for C4D is out 
heart. And uh, we would love to hear what you guys think about that. And of course, V-Ray 5 for uh, Revit is also out, also very big for those of you in the architecture community. And we've done a lot of interesting things in this area, including uh, you know a bunch of updates. So please let us know. Betas are always important for feedback. So thank you so much. V-Ray 5 for Revit and Beta. All of that is available at chaosgroup.com. Okay, uh, if people want to know more about the podcast, Kristen, where can they go? You can go to facebook.com slash podcast or chaosgroup.com slash cggarage. Perfect. And if you guys have any ideas of other things you want to do, like, you know, uh, other guests, like, thank you, Colin, for letting us know about this one. Uh, please uh, l uh, email us. Labs at chaoscoop.com is where you can email us. And that's where you get all the information about, uh, you know, all the different, uh, uh, you can tell us all about the, the different podcasts you like to have, as well as just give us feedback of uh, this particular episode or any of our previous episodes or, uh, or anything else you want to let us know about. And of course, you always get a good, another good place to give us feedback is on apple podcast which is uh, a good place to share us as well so give us a rating and a review there and uh oh yes right videos as you guys know for almost a year now we've been doing this in video format and they're available on our youtube channel that is chaos group tv is our youtube channel that's available as well as our facebook page where we put all the videos up there as well and that is facebook.com slash cg garage podcast i think that's about it right yep. Kristen? looks good okay perfect all right uh so with that being said please enjoy this awesome podcast with habib zarkapur welcome to another cg garage where the chaos group talks you'll know it's over when the last bucket drops we're gonna fire off rays in high dynamic range we know that ambient occlusion is passe Global illumination won't lead you astray And while image-based lighting is really swell You need to make sure everything has for now uh, Well, cool. Thank you so much. I'm so glad that uh, that Colin suggested, you know, you be on and uh, talk about the really cool stuff that we're doing. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very excited to talk to you. I've obviously been a huge fan of your work for many, many, many years. Obviously, you're, you, you are a big, when it, the word veteran comes to mind, but it's a, you've been around for, <laughs> for a long time in this area. I've been there for a long time and not quite, quite, as, quite as much as a, as a, as a legend as, as, as your work has been. Oh, it's uh, been fun. It's but been I fun. would love to know. I mean, everyone you know, sort of has their, their origin stories, and they're all a little bit different. Uh, but how, what was some of the things, you know, even in, in your youth or things that inspired you to get into filmmaking and get into visual effects and what sort of inspired you to get into the kind of things that you, you do? Um, you know, a lot of people, of course, quote this same thing where they're like, you know, the first time they saw Star Wars or, uh, right. you know, for me, uh, Blade Runner as well. Um, you know, yep. the, the, it, it's always impactful to when, when you experience uh films and then you know it it's like uh getting hit over the head with a with a bat and you're like wow like what what am i you know what are the all the things that went into what i just experienced and then uh you know i had a combination of when i was like 13 i wanted to be a product designer and okay and you know anything artistic was like what i wanted to do uh, and I mm -hmm. found out about industrial design watching TV in France, you know, and Luigi Colani was on TV showing, uh -huh. showing all these cars and planes and, and you know, vehicles and uh, p things that he designed that they actually built into real things. Uh, and I was like, wow, yeah, I just really want to design things. And, uh, you know, at some point I went to do architecture. I went to Vancouver to UBC, University of British Columbia. And okay. Talking to architects in Vancouver, they totally dissuaded me from going into architecture, and um, that you know that was like a um, big wake up call of uh, you know it, it's just very specific to Vancouver because there's tons of architects and not that many projects, so they were like you know you're just gonna get disillusioned. But um, somebody, okay. one of my professors, in thermodynamics professor Hill, his his name, he found out about Art Center College of Design. And he said, yes. you know, there's this design school because I was in Canada. There's no there was no undergrad design. 
you have to like graduate in, in engineering or something. You have to graduate from your university and then go to design school as, you know, like a master's or something. Right. And he's like, yeah, there's a school in art center. Like you can go. And I, I finished my mechanical mm -hmm. engineering because I, I, I used to be in fine art in the first year. And I thought, you know what? I'm just doing art on the side anyway. It doesn't make sense to go to university to learn about fine art. Uh, I switched to mechanical engineering because I needed to know how things, I wanted to know how things work. Like if I design a car, how do I know how thick to make the I-beams and all that stuff? And I was a, I was a sponge. I was really thirsty. Yep. And it was, it really, it, I, I was an artist uh, first. So diving into engineering was like, you know, definitely, you know, what's the word, what's the term they put, put yourself in, you know, extend yourself into uh, your comfort zone, out of your comfort zone. Uh, but I really want to face mm -hmm. the challenge and, you know, got through it and really learned a lot. And then ironically, every day in visual effects, I use that stuff. I mean, you know, right. every project I was on, I was like, oh yeah, I need physics for this. And I need that equation for that. And I need this for the shader <laughs> yep. and everything involved some engineering. So that worked out, you know, Twister, Perfect Storm, all of these parts like the pod race had a lot of physics. Uh, so yeah, of course, you did, never course. know how you're going to apply what you're learning, you know? Uh, right. and, and, yeah. and so that was, you know, a really great coincidence. So as much as painful as it was to push, put myself through it, I really pushed myself hard and I was taking fine art electives for everything. You know, I was doing, I was doing etching, silk screen printing, uh, you know, um, there was a lot of hands-on art classes I could at least keep that side going on and I was designing posters for the UBC sports program so all those kept me okay. kept the art side going but all throughout I just wanted to you know get into visuals and then when I went to Art Center a lot of my instructors were actually designers for film and uh, there was Kurt, right. Kurt Kaufman and Ed Eif. Ed Eif had designed the Rocketeer uh, stuff uh, Kurt Kaufman's did, uh, you know, the Digimat work on uh, a lot of films. And uh, they said, you know, you're good with design. You should do design for film. Having seen things like, you know, Star Wars and Blade Runner, you know, I was totally into sci-fi. And I was like, oh, my God, if I could just, like, design for film, I don't have to worry about getting right. sued if the toaster kills someone. You know what I mean? <laughs> on a real yeah. product, right? It's like it doesn't have to work. It just has to look nice. Mm -hmm. And, and just, you know, the whole conceptual part of like designing something from the future or something from a retro past, you know, whatever the case might be. And sure. And so, you know, those films really got my attention. And then that was right around uh, 1990. I was about to not to date myself, but I was about to graduate from, uh, you know, I was, I was about to graduate from Art Center. And that's, you know, after mm -hmm. I did UBC already uh, in engineering. And, um, you know, the, oh, there was like this uh, project that came out. It was, a, it was a movie. I was supposed to actually go to ILM as an intern. And okay. they, they came and checked my work. And it's like, yeah, this is great. We're going to have you as an intern. And then as it turned out, they, they never got back. And I found out that Terminator 2 had taken up all their machines. So they... They said, uh, oh, yeah, we don't have any enough machines for interns. Uh, but that summer, I got a job on a film anyway, uh, you know, Destiny, I guess. And then that movie was like everything right. I could learn about film. It was Adventures in Dinosaur City. became a Disney release. And it was Film 101. I was on on, on the actual okay. set, walking out to Force Perspective miniature with, uh, with dinosaurs in front and... You know, uh, Rick Victor was the DP and visual effects supervisor. And, we, you know, we were inventing stuff. Uh, we have a lot of firsts on that movie people haven't heard of. Right. Uh, we did, like, a, inserting a live action digitally into a matte painting. Uh, you know, it was all, like, you know, Rick would come off the set and go, if I shoot this, would you guys be able to do that with it, you know? And, right, right. and we would think about it and be like, yeah, why not? You know, let's, let's try it, you know? And... Uh, so it was a lot of figuring out how to scan film, how to how to output film. We were using his Mitchell camera frame by frame, shooting off the monitor, the SGI monitors. Uh, lots of invention going on. Uh, then I went back and finished Art Center for one more semester and went back into film with all the people I'd met, you know, uh, 
on on that on that movie we connected um and we, we, we were using uh, 486 computers with transputers and some render man compliant software called digital uh -huh. arts it was crazy times but you know i loved every second of it and yeah. I, I, and it was to me it was like hey i can take my visual skills and the computer skills and I, just to rewind a little bit um my brother worked at a, a, com a company called vertigo and they were like a bleeding edge cg at the time and they were known for character okay. animation but they wanted some product design my brother said can you come design a car and build it in their software you know and my mind was blown because uh, i've been good at imagining things in 3d in my head yeah but this 3d software was showing yeah, me yeah. what was in my head you know and i'm watching it and so i drew this car uh you know designed it digitized the cross sections uh, and then they had this thing called lofting. It was a brand new invention that you could take these cross sections uh -huh. and get a surface. So I lofted these surfaces right. together and lo and behold, I modeled the car and they showed it at Seagraph. And that was my introduction wow. to computer graphics. And I loved it. I was like, you know, uh, before that I was using airbrush and oil painting and, you know, all the hands-on art. Yep. But this was a whole new brush. And so having seen the abyss, and were you using alias? Is that what you were doing yes. alias at the yeah, time? Yeah, that's right. Okay. And and having seen the abyss, I was really hooked to like, oh my god, they use computers to do visual effects. You know, this is a game changer. Uh -huh. So I really pushed to get into that, and that's what we did with that Disney movie. Was like, we did three and a half minutes of CG, fifty eight shots. Uh, all of that's a record for the time, right. you know, because this is uh, this is right after the abyss. One year after the abyss. And and so. Uh, you know, it was great to try and figure things out. It was hilarious calling around, seeing if anyone can film record at 2K, uh, because the only thing that was around was um, right. these. Uh, I forgot the name of the Sinclairs or something. It was it was uh, this these machines that would um, re film record, but they're meant for slides. You know, they're meant for single <laughs> single print, and and here we were asking how much it would cost to do like, uh, you know, a hundred feet. So it was, the math wasn't right. You know, it was like, oh yeah, it's $10 a frame or something. And that whole, that whole thing is a whole nother story of like uh, connecting with a guy uh, who had film recorded Tron and he had film recorded, um, okay. Uh, the last Starfighter. Those were like big time early CG and right. his name was Lar Larry Sinclair, Lawrence. Yes, Sinclair. of course. And he was, you know, he's, I was calling around like, what's resolution? Can you scan film? And everybody was like 2K, 4K, you know. So I called him, I, you know, I got his number from somewhere. And he said, uh, 65K. And I almost fell off my chair. I'm like, excuse me, what? <laughs> 65K resolution? He's like, yep. So he had built his own laser to scan and film record. Okay. And I went to visit him. It was He was in the basement of CFI film with two Cray machines. And he had this silver sphere with a cylinder stuck on it and a wire. That was it. It's like, yeah, this is the laser scanner. And he pointed to these tapes, wow. these tapes uh, uh, all on a pole, sitting on a pole. And he points to them and he's like, that's Tron. That's the Tron data which I hope somebody wow. backed up because that would be, that would be a shame. But, um, yeah. you know, it was, and he was smart. He charged by the megabyte. You know, that was the, that was the fee. It was like, ha, I don't know what it, what it was, how many dollars per half a meg. Right. So we were doing the math. We're like, okay, so it's directly related to what resolution we want. But ironically, right. the first thing he did was Yulebrenner vision, which was 250 pixels, like really square, sharp pixels across the screen for Westworld, the original right. movie. And so anyway, that, that whole project was an eye opener. And then, then I started working in LA on IMAX movies for two years and I got into ILM. And the first movie I worked okay. on was The Mask with Jim Carrey. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And ILM. That's was a, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah. It was really fun. Uh, Steve Spaz Williams was an uh, animation supervisor. Yeah, I know Steve. He's been on this podcast. Yeah. So he's yeah. a, he's an awesome awesome guy, uh, you know. Always, always uh, thinking outside the box and funny and uh, 
uh, he's a yeah. character. So it was a it was a you know at the time I didn't know him and he was like a very intimidating looking guy, and yeah. you know he looked like uh, you know like a Harley Davidson biker, and yeah, still uh, does. Yeah. He's like, <laughs> so they told me that like Spaz wants to meet you, and he at the time his office was in his basement in uh, C building at the time mm -hmm. in Kerner. And, and you had to go down this long flight of stairs to the basement. And I remember being terrified going down, down there, opening this door to this room that had no windows. <laughs> and, you know, of course, Swaz is a sweetheart and it was amazing yeah, working with him. And then uh, later I got to yeah. work with Stefan Fangmeier on many projects, um, lots of natural nice. disasters, you know, Twister, Perfect Storm. I worked with John Nolan yeah. on Star Treks and, um, and Star Wars Episode One, and you know it's always really about the people you yeah. work with. It's really that that's what was amazing. Yeah, for sure, for sure. But those are some those are some big shows. I mean, I mean, obviously Twister is well known as, as well as Perfect Storm, and I, you got nominated for some Oscars, I believe, on those shows as well. Yeah, right? so. and one, I won two Baftas. Very lucky. Um, and two and won two Baftas exactly. So so yeah, for sure. Yeah, and uh, at the time, the VES hadn't been formed yet. <laughs> um, I was a founding member yep. of the VES in uh, 2000. It was uh, beginnings. It's great to have that. Yes, 2000 was the first year of the VES. That's right. I remember that for sure. Yeah. Uh, I got into the industry in 2001. That was my first time mm -hmm. in visual effects. So that's kind of where I where I started in that area. But yeah, that's uh, that's really awesome. The, those are some, you know, obviously some very important shows. And there were also things that were, you know, never done before, like big atmospheric stuff for, for Twister. I mean, that had never been done before. Perfect Storm had, you know, incredible fluid simulators, uh, simulations at the time was like a, a big, big deal uh, and still looks great it even today. So those show. are really, really great shows. Show, yeah. yeah, it's funny now I'm yeah, doing real-time sure. water. Uh, we did that for Greyhound previous. Uh, and uh, right. that... Right. That's really, really, really cool, mind blowing stuff. Worked with NVIDIA on some real time sims. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Now, you mentioned also, obviously, you said that, you know, Blade Runner was one of your, you know, things that inspired you, but you also worked on Blade Runner 2049. So, uh, with with uh, Paul Lambert, who I know very well, I used to work with Paul back in Digital Domain at the, at the time. But Paul is awesome. uh, yeah. what, what, what was that show like? Because that was, it's a gorgeous show. I absolutely love that movie. That's definitely been, been a huge highlight uh, of my whole career. John Nelson, visual effects supervisor on that, called me and, and um, s to see if I can, you know, help them with some things. And, and uh, the timing was perfect. And yeah, being a fan of the original, I was uh, really, really um, uh, blown away by what I was seeing on the second one. And, and, and also, I was a huge fan of Denis. Villeneuve, the director, yeah, uh, you know, he, he yeah. Had Arrival, and there's a French Canadian movie, Incendie, that he did. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so yeah, he was a perfect guy, perfect vision for the project, and his team is amazing. His team of editors, uh, you know, Javier and uh, Joe. Uh, there, there's a uh, you know, the, the, the there was like visual effects work on it you know, to help uh, just look at a ton of shots with John. There were seven facilities, you know, 1,400 shots, and we were getting, you know, two, 300 shots a day coming across from facilities, and we had to review them. So we were just, you know, locked in our editorial rooms <laughs> reviewing things. And, uh, yep. uh, you know, the, the, the work Paul uh, Paul's team did at Dineg was amazing. Uh, frame stores... Uh, amazing stuff. UPP was involved. M MPC in Montreal doing, you know, the recreations, uh, digital digital humans, right. and and so there were so many different aspects the show was pushing. And then to top it off, we got to have Denis use uh, this virtual camera tool that I was working on uh, at the time that uh, helps you film in real time. So we got him, you know, mm -hmm. uh, to operate and create the shots that needed uh you know specific camera work and then 
you know, those are those went straight into the film. That that was an amazing um, combination. But just to be, you know, sitting can you describe next, a, um, a little bit what those cameras look like or what how that camera worked? Can you describe a little bit what yeah, it was? So so there was. Um, there was a number of shots that we had to rework, you know, either joining two shots that were separate or adding completely new shots because the sequence felt like it needed more, like going from the mm -hmm. Los Angeles to the orphanage. And um, mm -hmm. Denise editors, Javier and Joe had seen the real time tools that I was, you know, I'd been using on, uh, um, on other shows. Uh, we started, we, we, we built tools for Jungle Book, the John Favreau used, and then Ready Player One uh, through Digital Domain yeah. to, to do all the real-time game engine stuff using the Unity game engine. And then the, mm -hmm. the tools had evolved. And then uh, at that point, I'd left Microsoft and built our own tools. And so they saw the tools and they saw like you could go anywhere in LA, attach yourself to the spinner and fly, you know, and just film, you know, be inside it, be outside it. Uh, or just pan, you know, having right. to fly across. And I, I just brought in the assets from Previs that MPC had built. And things come really right. easily into the engine and you can just start filming. So so in addition to all the visual effects supervision work, uh, I, you know, I just put, put these scenes together and then Javier and Joe looked at it and they're like, you know what, we should show Denis this tools. And, mm -hmm. you know, so Joe's like, leave it to me. I'm going to show him what, what what's possible. And then... You know, with Denis, things are, he's very decisive. It's, it's either love or hate, you know, black and white. And and so he okay. said, one, you know, we would sit in John Nelson's office uh, two hours a day reviewing stuff with Denis uh, that, that, you know, things that we'd, we'd seen uh, from other facilities that, that needed his approval uh, or Roger Deakins' approval, he would be on the phone. Um, mm -hmm. And so he turned to me, he said, you know, um, I saw these tests you did and and I was bracing my, you know, I was <laughs> holding on to the chair handle to see if he's like really angry about it or he liked it. And he said, uh, you know, he said, you know, I really, I really, uh, it was very promising. Can we get together and shoot some, some of the scenes? So nice. that was amazing. And so we set some time and, um, you know, did the camera work for, you know, a uh, handful of shots really quickly and he he was like yeah this is it i like this is the camera move you know um okay and so one of them was really cool it was the spinner inside the trash mesa and k is inside and he gets shot at yep and then he starts uh, uh -huh. you know he's supposed to gain altitude go around the ship and fly over it and get harpooned and right that used to be two shots and then he really wanted it as one fluid shot, but we never quite got that camera work and the spinner animation uh, in the time frame that we had because we were like a month from release. So, okay. So then, um, what I did was uh, I gave I, I attached the spinner to the virtual camera, and he got to fly it by just pointing the camera, the virtual camera. So there's a sensor and whatever okay. he does with this virtual camera, the real camera does. But in this case, he's flying forward. So wherever he's pointing, he's going to end okay. up flying. And so first he tried to do the motion we were trying to get, which is fly around this pylon and over the ship. And he kept crashing into the ship. There just wasn't, it was too tight a turn. Right. And so he brings Joe over. Okay. At first he's like, oh, I don't know if I can do this. You know, uh, Habib, this is really hard. He brought Joe over. They looked at the cut and then he said, well, you know, um, what you know the only basically all I, all I all that he would want to do at this point is he would want to gain altitude because he's getting shot at so he all right he altered the, the animation that goes in the scene so instead of flying straight going around and then over he just gained altitude and went around a different pylon and so we recorded that flight path right. and then i put him back inside the spinner attached him inside and then he hand performed the mm -hmm. camera move. That shot's in the movie. Right. So you can see his nice. point of view with the wipers going and he's looking in front, gaining altitude. Then he looks to the lower left through the door, the window on the bottom, sees the ship go by. And that right. was the shot. And luckily I had those Trash Mesa assets from Framestore. 
that that um, you know that, that sent um, you know it, it was like the high res photogrammetry scans, but luckily uh, you know that worked out that we, you know we were able to um, just bring those in and run them in real time, uh, and 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 you know Denis knew right away he got the shot he wanted. Uh, the one where the right. the the spinner is flying along the seawall is another one where the camera starts below and then it goes above and you see the ocean and the wall and you also see the spaceship yep, yep, in yep, the sky. Camera. That's a completely new shot that he completely shot himself freehand and we had some camera smoothing okay. built in and then um, you know that Paul's team rendered that a couple of weeks before release. Uh, so that wow. we got really lucky that went in and he was then he was happy because they did some test screenings and he said they felt there wasn't enough time from LA to the orphanage it felt too short didn't feel like a trip okay so that shot uh, also he wanted to show the relationship between LA the seawall and the ocean and the size of the spinner and the spaceship all of these things you you never saw together uh, so got it there's other shots where we did a dolly uh, there's a dolly in, in Vegas uh, that I did with Rich Hoover from Framestore. And then there's uh, another one Denis did is the one uh, of the um, Wallace Towers, the three concrete blades. Um, there was a yep. There was a, a shot, a miniature shot of those that was uh, we, we were trying to make, um, make work uh, best we could with John Nelson and I trying um, to you know, change the lighting values on the different passes to see if we can get it to read. And it, it, it was very difficult from that angle. The spinner was passing by the camera and you just weren't sure what you're looking at because you hadn't seen it. And so right. um, with Denis, we location scouted this low angle that you see these towers, you know, with a really wide lens. And so uh, that became a combo where I was dollying and he was operating the camera head. Uh, so those shots, uh, you know, went in the film, and I think they turned out really great. And you can kind of feel his, you know, the handheld live aspect of it. You know, it feels like a helicopter was really right. filming it. Um, but and it they helped give scale, uh, scale to the film. Yep. But you know, one of the techniques um, I came up with on that project, just out of necessity of time, was. Um, we would we would be seeing a ton of shots, and then both Denny and Roger Deakins would have a, a note on it about, let's say, uh, the the color of the, the detail in the sky, or there'd be there'd be some note about um, something to do with um, I think I think it has something to do with, for example, how dark or light something is in frame, and these mm -hmm. are things that would you know. In the visual effect process, uh, it takes time for a shot to go back to the artists. They get the notes, they work on it, it renders overnight, it gets composited, it gets sent back. You know, uh, we download it, we check it. Uh, the turnaround's difficult, right? Because there's a lot of rendering that has to happen. And right. so you're looking at anywhere from you know three days to a week, two weeks to get a shot back. And you know, uh -huh. there would always be like, you know, Roger would say darker and it would come back and he would be like, no, I meant darker than that. No, I meant darker than that. So every <laughs> every note you're like, you have you're, you're losing yeah, a yeah. week. So so John Nelson and I are like, you know, we, we need to speed things up. I just started taking screenshots of the videos of the video takes that we, we had, um, drop right. it into Photoshop, quickly mask off things brighten them, darken them, you know, just, just see what I can do. And then, um, I have, I had to like really quickly, um, uh, make a wedge. So I'd have a wedge of, you know, um, let's say, you know, usually four to five pieces. Uh, John and I would look sure. at it and go, okay, here's a, here's a range of dark, you know, uh, on this, you know, there, yep. was, there was those giant trash ships, right, that are dumping trash. And right. uh, so, you know, I kept darkening the side and also I had a wedge for uh, smoothing the sky. Because one of the big things for um, both Raja and Denis was that the sky should have no detail in it. 
Um, and and mm. for whatever reason, the artists love adding just some hint of some cloud detail, and they would be like, "No, it's it's flat," you know. Right. So that was something. Fogged in. That's right. <laughs> so so quickly, we would do the paint overs, send it to Roger and Denny, or show it to Denny, send it to Roger, and then uh, they would you know they would just pick one. It would be A B C D E F, right? And then Roger would be like, yeah, it's right. D, it's F, you know, that's the one. And and then Denis would approve it. And then we had a visual target for how dark or how flat, yeah. you know, or how silhouetted or yeah. how whatever the note was. And so, you know, right. uh, by the end of the project, I checked my folders. I had 500 Photoshop files right? just yeah, from yeah. doing these, these reviews. And each file was just, was all the wedges, right, in one file. And, and, uh. You know, it's one of those, right, right. Uh, you know, it just saved time. It helped communication. And it was, you know, it was just like a, a great way to, you know, sh find out exactly what the, what they meant, you know, what they wanted in a, in a quick way, right? Sure. Because it's really fast to iterate on just flat layers. And I, I, I myself was surprised, you, you know, how quickly one can just mask off things you know it sounds painful but once you do a few of them you're like oh this is two minutes you know and then at some point right. um you know the, the the snow scene in the in the lab the memory lab outside the memory lab yep. there used to be yep. these sculptures that that actually okay. looked they looked like wallace tower the, the wallace towers in miniature and okay we you know Denis kept iterating on their size and placement and, you know, it was just a, a long process or over months. And, and finally, that became one of the candidates for the paint over, as we call them. So I just grabbed the shot, grabbed these these monuments and started to mess with their size and placement just in Photoshop. So it's like, you know, showing him a bunch of options. So we were wedging them and looking at those and then um, I'll never forget this is one of my great memories. So Denis sitting there and I I can I started sensing what he wants or thinks at some point, you know, where where he's commenting on shots. And I just started painting them out completely <laughs> because one of the themes of the whole project was um Denis a minimalist. He's a you know, he likes things to look simple and yep uh, on a ton of shots uh obviously us vfx artists we love detail we just love detailing out stuff so these artists would just uh -huh. add a ton of detail and he would just be like no remove this remove this remove this paint this out paint this out and so uh i knew i knew that's what he was thinking so i just started painting them out without saying anything and he looks over at my laptop and he's like you know, I'm afraid that's what we're gonna have to do. <laughs> You're on to, you know. He, he just had to, you know. I, I, we both were like, yeah. Sadly, <laughs> we just have to remove it. Yep, we have to remove all the detail and all the design out of yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. So, so that was. Uh, uh, so I, I do have, I do have a couple of questions, especially about the feedback loop that you're getting. This is a really great to hear all of that that stuff and understand that. But, you know, when you're dealing, you know, Villeneuve is obviously a fantastic uh, uh, director and I, I can't wait to see what Dune turns out to be. I'm <laughs> really excited about Me that. Too. Yeah. But obviously Roger Deakins is a legendary, uh, legendary DP and uh, really knows what he's doing and communicating. Uh, but, you know, since he's, you know, since he's been doing this for so long, what was it like to to communicate with him. Did you feel that you weren't able to communicate fast enough to get his ideas out or like, you know, because obviously there's a lot of relationships that eventually will lead us to the conversation of virtual production and what that means. Yeah. But I'm wondering like right then at that moment when you're dealing with, with Blade Runner 2049, what was that communication with him and how did you try to work with that in that area? Yeah, luckily Roger loved the real time stuff uh, that came out of what Denis shot. He loved the look because we had a very even sky, <laughs> even though it, you know it was real time fog. Yeah. But you know it was nice and even. But um, you know, I have to say I've never seen a DP so involved in post. Uh, typically, mm. the DPs aren't you know in pre production maybe, 
and then they're on the shoot. Yeah. Uh, and then everything's in the hands of just the VFX uh, soups and the directors. And, and Roger was uh, so incredibly involved and he was uh, so busy on color timing the film. He didn't have time to come to Sony where we were, even though we're both in LA. He was at eFilm at right. his facility and he would, you would call in, you know, on a conference call into our reviews and what, you know, we would send a sync. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, when I started doing the painovers, I would just email, uh, email, email him and his wife and they're a good team that worked together mm -hmm. creatively. And they were, they would both review things and send, you know, send back, uh, you know, the, the answer, you know, it's this one, it's this one. And, and after right, right, right. doing after after you know hearing his reviews and notes on shots and you know uh, helping supervise them to happen with the visual effects facilities you know and doing the paint overs, I have to say uh, you know because everybody says like he's 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 Eagle Eye as his nickname right uh, and, and it's it's absolutely true it's absolutely true the things he would notice and see right. uh, were remarkable and and so his contribution to the visual effects and post was astounding so he really really deserved that dp oscar on that project because not only not only did he do awesome. all the craziness on set which was uh you know these massive banks of lights to get that fog in vegas to look you know uh this orange fog or you know just the different scale of things um but but he really saw it through you know and it was really consistent with his vision, just like Denis was. So both of them together, uh, you know, really were amazing creative partners on that movie and, and helped, they helped the vision, uh, you know, and they, they really they stuck to their guns. And so that was really amazing to work with Roger and also um, be able to uh, deploy the real-time tools and, and, and do this whole paint over thing uh, just to get things sped up you know, and get us, get us, uh, get them what they were looking for faster, you know, in a really crude 2D way, and then have that be uh, a target, you know? Right. So I think those well, were it's, the it's, techniques. It's really do. great. I mean, uh, you, the, the work speaks for itself, honestly, and it's, and it's really nice. I and mean, I'm sure you know this, but as a visual effects uh, person, when you have a DP actually contribute to the vision, you, you, you get, it, it, it livens it up and it feels better. Uh, generally speaking, I've had a couple of DPs that start to get in. Claudio was one of the people I worked with on, on Oblivion and he was a little bit, uh, definitely more involved in color and timing and lighting. Uh, but it's always better than try to guess <laughs> what the vision is. You know what I mean? Very true. Very true. And they, they see things, uh, you know, they, they had an intent when shooting something that we wouldn't necessarily know. One yeah, of the, we're not privy to that. That's yeah. right. One of the really interesting things was uh, inside Wallace's uh, building, uh, where Rachel is. There's there's this um, Roger built this rotating array of lights, and, mm -hmm. and so these lights would rotate. You know, it, it would just keep spinning. So if you watch the scene, you'll see the light and shadow on Harrison Ford and Rachel is constantly moving. And, hmm. and it was just it made it an even bigger challenge to do the digital. But, um, you know, on the wide shots, one of the visual effect shots was to put some, you know, some kind of science fiction looking spinning lights that are just spinning in the air to justify that's okay. where the light source is coming from, you know. And, and so we tried all kinds of combinations of what that looked like. And, and right. in the end, of course, we removed everything. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course, <laughs> Remo yeah, yeah. removed the detail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, really, r really great stuff. Now, you mentioned obviously real time, uh, and you know, you said that you know, Jungle Book was what you'd worked on uh, before. Um, before Blade Runner, uh, and I do want to understand where you get to Blade Runner. But was was Jungle Book the first time that you really started to to really dive deep into a virtual production thing, or had you actually looked at real time and virtual production in a different capacity before then? When was sort of the first time you got involved in that? I would say um, in Perfect Storm in the year two thousand, right. um, we had the ocean simulations pre calculated that would take. Uh, 
something like a week to run on an SGI 32 processor tower. And, yeah. and then, but we would cache that data and I could play it through in real time uh, on my SGI machine through Maya. We had a special plugin that uh, Masi Oka wrote, you know, the actor. <laughs> yeah, 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 I do know him. Heroes, yeah. yeah. So he wrote this plugin that would just take the water files, we call them, and, and bring them into Maya and it would run in real time. Right. And, and then I created these uh, ship simulations. Uh, you know, that was a lot of fun. I was, I was using the Maya rigid body system. So it was a uh -huh. rigid body in the shape of the hull of the ship. So it had all yep. the correct moment of inertia that, that it needed. That, that part of Maya's rigid bodies are amazing. And then mm -hmm. I basically had these markers that were basically death sensors on the hull. So I put these okay. locators around the hull and I would check for depth. Along along the ship to know how far below the water level is this part of the ship, all, right. and then all of these would get added into the fluid dynamic equations. I got some help from John Anderson, who wrote the big fluid sims, and then yeah. uh, this would all run in real time. Okay. So the ocean playback and the ship simulation would run in playback in yeah. real time, and then that's oh, pretty good for two thousand. Not bad. <laughs> then then the we started constantly ending up underwater because these waves were like 50 feet 70 foot waves so you you're, right. you're trying to film another ship and you're just constantly underwater and then someone of course says i think it was stefan fine where he's like why don't we just put the camera on another simulated ship makes sense right. so now you're shooting ship to ship realistically so then we had a camera boat put a camera on that so that ship's running dynamic simulation with physics then I had physics on the camera itself. The camera was also a rigid body. And then I gave right. it these uh, um, points to look at with some physics equations to mimic human behavior. And it had literally these factors, these attributes on it called uh, drunk factor and smart factor. And, okay. and, and a human cinematographer is very drunk and very smart. <laughs> and those okay. are the parameters. And that, what that means is if you're trying to film something and it starts moving really quickly, you're not going to be able to follow it like an aim constraint. You're not a machine. Right. It's going to go right. out of frame. And then you're going to be like, oh, crap, I need to follow that. So you're smart, right. yeah, yeah. which means you catch up to it. So right. Between those parameters, we end up with these physics cameras that was simulating hum humans filming. But all, right. we, all I need to do is give it a target look at point, and that point could animate or move. You say, look at the pilot house, now look at the front of the ship. You know. And so essentially, we had these scenes where you placed the hero ship, you placed the camera ship, and you told it where to look, hit play, and you got a whole performance ship to ship shot that was really, really dynamic because everything is moving and the camera is trying to follow something, including the up and down of the sea. And that was right. that was my first taste of, you know, real time virtual production. And what, right. got, what got better was we would have these satellite sessions at the time, there was no Zoom uh, mm -hmm. or Skype. And we had these thousand dollar an hour satellite sessions they were very expensive <laughs> but they were worth it we had john seal in australia we had wolfgang mm -hmm. Peterson, the director in la and we were in the bay area and they were directing me to put the position the ships hit play and get a shot right and so we would place the sailboat or replace the andrea gale position the camera ship find a wave you know it was like we did have location scouting and it was all just waves we were like find a nice right. wave uh, for what we're looking for, right? We, we're looking for a wave to just take over or we're waiting, we want need the backside, we're going towards them, away from them. You know, pick yep. a wave height. We have all these buttons for these things. I had the, the most amazing Maya shelf, you know, with all the tools, <laughs> you know, what <laughs> yeah. option do you want? So we would basically set up the shot, hit play and get a shot, you know, right. with, with feedback from uh, the DP, John Seal. So that was also a case where the DP was really involved in post. And, mm. and so, you know, going f fast forward to Star Wars Episode One, we're doing the pod race. All the scenes outside the arena are all digital. And so these pods are flying and crashing at 800 miles an hour. We yeah. are actually going that speed in the software, which is amazing for floating point precision with physics. Yeah. And then you know, we would basically crash a pod. So we got Mars pod, he gets the wrench in the engine, goes down. And these were all simulations running using the rich body system. And I came up with ways to make them look like soft body deformation. 
imagine you take a whole bunch of bricks and connect them with with uh, with chewing gum <laughs> that doesn't let go. Right. So the, it's a solid frame, but if you hit a wall or hit the ground, it'll start deforming. The bricks don't change shape, but they start bending. Right. So it's like an airframe. I call it an airframe technique. So so the parts yep. would deform hitting the ground and start tumbling at that speed. We would put these giant invisible foam blocks for them to trip on. Because oh, we right. needed to hit the ground and then start tumbling at a certain frame. So we put this invisible obstacles that you turn off. And it's sure right. enough, on the right frame, they would start tripping. Uh, one of the favorite shots was uh, Sebulbapod getting separated from his engine, you know, after he's locked with Anakin. And right. one of his engines goes flying like this. You know, one goes into a hill, the other one flies to his camera and goes over and above. That thing was using targeting physics. And uh, uh, I had a way to tell it where to aim. And then uh, George Lucas was like, he wanted it to go ca off camera right. So if you watch that shot, you can really see it feels like an out of control, you know, uh, rocket and, and, and it's, you know, ends up going out of frame right. But that was all physics. Uh, John, right. John Noel, um, who was the VFX super on that film, both him and I are big nerds when it came to physics. He was the one who came up with the idea of simulating the pods. And he had this 2D right. spring simulation and he's like, look, we can make the pods feel realistic, you know, and, and I'll never forget, uh, I put that, I took two cylinders in Maya. This is yep. Maya beta. It hasn't come out yet. <laughs> Everybody's <laughs> like, ah, oh, they're rigid bodies. We can't use them. It's, you know, they don't have ropes. And I, I right. my engineering background. I was like, well, you just take some cylinders, pin them together and you have a rope. So that was, the, <laughs> yep. that was the system for the pod, uh, pods following the engines. But we took two engines and connected them with, with these springs. So there was four springs across and four diagonal. And John, Noah, John and I watching the monitor, we hit play. And these two cylinders just start going, they just go like this, affecting each other like, like you wouldn't believe it. And just that, just like, just the idle physics. Him yeah. and I were out jaws were on the ground. We're like, oh my God, this, we ha this is the way we have to do it. So, that's the way to so go. Every yeah. pod shot is a rigid body simulation. That's um, amazing. That's really cool. But, yeah, really, you really know, cool. The animators would basically puppeteer where that, for them where they should go. Then the physics right. would take over all the little bits and pieces. But yeah, uh, yeah, for I, sure. What, what got me to talk about that? Oh, yeah, virtual production. Uh, so, so, yeah, exactly. So, Star Wars was another one where we would do these simulations of these pod crashes and then film all the shots. So it was like one animation and then we would film it. Um, and we, you know, we had plans of like flying the pods with joysticks, like it's a real time game, but we didn't, you never got to that. Yeah. But when you did Jungle Book, obviously there's, you know, that was a, that was a big jump in, 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 in virtual production. You had cameras and everything else and you, you had one live action character and everything else had to be seen in real time to film in real time. So mm -hmm. what was that transition like? What was that project like when you were working on that? Um, it was really magical to see that on set. And uh, I, I, I wish Disney would at some point release uh, some of the behind the scenes because it, it really was history in the making. Um, mm -hmm. we had, you know, a Bill Pope, the DP moving the lights in real time, uh, you know, filming shots with all the virtual lighting in it. Uh, and then you had these actors becoming animals. It's 14 actors became seven wolves seamlessly. You're looking, you could swear you're looking at wolves being mocapped. Right. And then, you know, he could just direct them and have them do it, perform a different performance or look at a different way and film them, cut it all together, see if it works you know, tweak shots that need uh, tweaking or reshoot some shots. Um, but, you know, we started that work in 2010 when I was at Microsoft. And okay. we used the Unity 3.5 engine and we customized the rendering. We, we totally added all these features that we needed for HDR buffers. Uh, you know, we had, we had high dynamic range rendering, depth of field bouquet, um, LUTs, lookups, you name it, you know, linear lighting, all of this stuff uh, we were able to put in. Um, I had a fantastic team that worked worked on that. Uh, you know, we had I had John Habel, who's the you know the master of any uh, gamma correct lighting and real time engines, uh, doing mm -hmm. doing the HDR linear lighting and the bokeh depth of field. And then um, 
Wes Potter, who I partnered with afterwards to do Exposure, which was the newer version. Um, the the team was able to put the tools together. At the time, we did a demo to James Cameron uh, with their assets, and, and Joe Letteri was there. You know, they were really happy with the results, and that kind of became. That was in 2010. Uh, okay. In February 2011, we did the demo. That that became a really positive step for the direction they wanted to go in. Uh, they ended up yep. building their own tools so that were real time. Uh, but you know, having watching Jim use the tools and you know, really really um, uh, enjoy the process of shooting and having all the things that he wanted to be addressed addressed, we were able to hit them all. Um, you know, there was two frames of lag instead of seven or ten. Uh, he could he right. could compose in real time, and we were we were using the actual high res models from Weta. The full res, right? Uh, Jake and Natiri, and so that was a really magical uh, demo. Uh, I wish I had more footage of it, but basically, um, that was the beginning of knowing what we have. But then it took many years for that to actually be deployed on a project. In 2012, Alex okay. McDowell, uh, we were partnering with Alex McDowell, the production designer. He's a visionary, and yeah. he really got the virtual production. I, he's aspect. been on this podcast. I know Alex as well. Yeah. <laughs> He's a remarkable guy, and uh, it was it was tremendous to work with him. And we worked with him on Disney's Order of Seven in 2012. Okay. That's when we realized the power of these tools aren't just faster, better looking. It was um, actually a game changer for c uh, communication across the board yes. with people working on a project and changing the results. Just like what Denis experienced mm -hmm. when he performed the shot and decided to change what it should hap what should happen in the shot. It's the same kind of thing, but multiplied by every single person who's involved creatively. And so both both Alex and I were surprised at that discovery. We didn't we didn't actually anticipate that it would be that, you know, how far reaching those could be. And producers would come up and we had the the set running in real time on a big TV. So whoever, whenever they want to come, they could interact with it. And it was really sure. amazing to see people's reaction and what they would go back and change. And so a Jungle Book around uh, 2013, also starting with Alex McDowell. He was initially the production designer on that. Uh, and then he had to um, do more work on the USC side. You know, he was a professor. But basically, um, he got us you know, doing a demo for Rob Legato at Digital Domain. And, and he put us through the paces, you know. Uh, yep. And he liked what he saw. And it's like, yeah, this is what we want to use. And so... Um, you know, we, we continued developing and honing those tools through the project. At the time, yep. we were streaming from Motion Builder into Unity. And, and so the tools really focused around all the interfaces for that and lighting tools and, and, and all the things that needed to be real time on set. Uh, so right. that was, it was really incredible and magical on set to watch you know, John Farrell, Rob, you know, and Bill Pope doing their thing. And, and I really hoped um, one day you get to see, or people get to see that. Uh, yeah, you know, and it was it was a big first. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It was a very important film, I think, in a lot of ways because of the the workflow that was happening and and filmmaking. And you know, obviously, there's been incremental stuff that that happened, as you mentioned before, in, in terms of virtual production. But that was one of the films that's like, no, we're going to do a lot. Like it's going to yeah. be all filmed in other ways. And I think that those are. Those are great, uh, great moments, uh, uh, and I think that was also very important. It's also the moment when game engines started to really come into play uh, into the into the world because you know I think that much we could do with Motion Builder, <laughs> you know, Motion Builder has been, oh yeah, and it's finally the game engines like well we could help you, we could help you, we can be involved in in, in Jungle Book and even actually in the Lion King and some other things that were, that were done. It was really kind of a part of the Unity team. Am I right in saying that? Um, well, so yeah, through through Jungle Book and Ready Player One, uh, those were just my team working with the latest Unity we could get and do all the virtual production work as, right. as plugins. It, by by the time we got to Ready Player One, that was Unity five point four. And so they'd added a few rendering features so that we didn't have to include. Uh, but I remember showing up on set and helping. Um, Girish at the time was the VCAM room operator. Uh, there was the live on stage, and then there's the VCAM room where 
Spielberg would compose, you know, would, would shoot shots that they recorded um, to do extra okay. camera work on it. And so I showed up to help him get some new features like volumetric lighting and uh, other plugins. But, um, you know, that project was really pushing the volume of stuff. There was like, I think they prepared like 2000 scenes. Uh, you know, and 600 were, okay. weren't used, <laughs> but you know, they, they were able to, you know, that was a perfect project for virtual production because everything's in VR. Uh, so the actors, right. Steven, the product designer were, could all be in VR looking at the sets. I know, uh, Adam Stockhausen, the production designer used VR to design them. So he, we, you know, a digital domain gave him, uh, mm -hmm. basically a mini setup of our tools so he could look in there. Uh, Digital Domain did a lot of the VR tools on that project for the VR filming side. Um, and then we were doing okay. all the live on set, you know, pushing through from Motion Blur uh, into Unity. And on that project, the communication became two-way. So we added, uh, I think Wes Potter was, uh, and John Wheeler were programming. So you could actually move something in, in Motion Builder or Maya and see it move in Unity, or you could move it in Unity and they would move in the other two. And it didn't matter which one you used. And so oh, nice. the, the power, and, and this is what we all set, live links, basically. That's right. And the power of what we set up, started uh, doing even for Jungle Book was that you can have 10 artists operating on the same scene, which is necessary on these big projects where you have, you know, right. time is money and you want things done immediately. So uh, uh, then you don't have the bottleneck of one artist, you know, and what they could do. And so I know I, you know, Stephen appreciated that and he was able to really harness it even more and more throughout the project. Um, and so but between those two, those really push the tools, uh, you know, to a really good place. And, you know, at, at that point, um, I think those are the, you know, the, the only two big projects using, using uh, game engines on set. Uh, after that, um, you know, I think obviously we've come a long way now with uh, many, many projects between all the engines now getting into getting into it but it's really great to see the industry um you know getting a lot more mature about it you know it, it was frustrating to have these tools and you do a demo and people are like i don't know what what is this like what are we you know they didn't know what they're looking at so like we had this since 2010 yeah, yeah. you know and it took you know it took three years to find a project we could totally use it and then, you know, even now, just people are finally seeing things and hearing about other, you know, uh, LED screens and all the things that are happening. And, and it's, it's starting to click, which is great, you know. And so that's a big right. part because you'll still have people that, you know, they'll say, um, you know, there's directors that'll say, oh, I don't believe in previs. You know, well, what's that for? How does it benefit me? Or producers yeah. that say, how do, how do I save money? It's going to cost me to do previous. How does that save me money? Um, so, you know, right. like we know as a fact how it's contributed, <laughs> you know, on every show. Um, but it has to, I don't know, you need like, you almost need two groups of people to do the exact same movie two different ways and <laughs> compare notes later. Uh, oh. I don't know. <laughs> It should be soon, hopefully, it should be a no-brainer. Yeah, you know, I think virtual production is definitely the way to go. And a lot of different things that are, that are happening in that area, and I really find it fascinating. Um, I, would, I would love to know more about, uh, you know, where you think things are going. So if you have other projects that are coming up that we can, can look into, you know, what, is there something we can, we can look at, uh, uh, you know, look to and say, okay, that's interesting what's happening in the future of virtual production? Yes, there's a, there's a bunch. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm working on one right now. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm several, sure. several. Yeah. Yeah. It's very exciting. And, you know, the current situation uh, in the world uh, has pushed that to, you know, accelerate even more as a necessity. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Well, that's that's awesome. So we'll look forward to to seeing those. And I really, you know, I'm going to thank Colin uh, again for for doing the introduction and and getting us together. But uh, there's a lot of great stuff, and I really appreciate you know sort of hearing that history of what led one to the other, and and the deep dive into Blade Runner 2049 was a, a, 
an amazing story. I really <laughs> appreciate that as well. So yeah, this has been really great. great. Thank you so much for doing this. Thanks. It's great to uh, meet you and, and uh, you know, go down um, the memory lane on these really cool projects. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> Let's do it. Mark. All right. Thanks so much for me, but really appreciate it. Thank you, Chris.